when a member of their community assassinated gandhi ji what followed was also wrong and it's never talked about which is this massive rioting against the maharashtrian brahmin community savarkar's brother narayan was dragged out of his house and stoned to death the revolutionaries remember are modernists after independence Mm, the revolutionaries were deliberately uh, pushed out of the national uh, power structure the single most important event that led to indian freedom is the naval revolt it is unnecessarily foisted on the uh, uh, indian muslim most of them are descendants of indians not of uh, turkic invaders mughals did try to make their way back and babar is absolutely clear why he came to india he came for the gold he says so himself dyer was actually given a saropa in uh, in the yes. golden temple now that is bad in itself but when you go there you realize that the jallianwala bagh and the golden temple are 300 meters apart idea of khalistani movement interestingly even today comes from exactly those same gurudwaras that had been infiltrated with hopkinson 100 years ago the bbc uh program that was recently done very yeah. controversial one what is interestingly that much of this is actually done by people of indian ethnic origin india is a rising power mm. and so many of the deep state and corporate and uh, uh, geo strategic interests um will want to trip us Namaste Jai Hind welcome to another edition of ANI podcast with Smita Prakash Today my guest is noted historian and economist Sanjeev Sanyal Sanjeev is very active on social media and he's a hot favorite at Litfest where he talks about Indian history its biases which he says are Nehruvian colonial and Marxist in nature His critics say that he plays to majoritarian biases but there is no doubting his scholarship. He is the recipient of the Eisenhower Fellowship named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum and adjunct fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies at the NUS Singapore, fellow at the Royal Geographical Society London, visiting scholar at the Oxford University. and because sanjeev sanyal is member of the economic advisory council to the prime minister of india and help prepare six editions of the economic survey of india there will be a few questions on the state of the indian economy but first about his book uh, revolutionaries the other story of how india won its freedom sanjeev thank you so much for coming on the podcast you've done a whole lot of tv interviews about your book um you know i had uh, on the podcast j sai deepak and vikram sampath who spoke about how indian history was one sided now most of us the only source of history as such was that what we read in school textbooks and now all of you are coming out a whole bunch of you are coming out authors um telling us that our history narrative narration which was there in our textbooks was one sided was colored and you coming out with these stories making us rethink that you know why weren't we told about all this earlier why was our history so colored so biased so first of all thank you very much smita for having me on your show um why did i write the book uh, well it's a multiple uh, factors here obviously one part of it of course as many people have guessed many of the characters in the book are directly related to me so i had some interest in those characters i knew some of them incidentally many of them lived into the 1980s uh, but i think the real thrust of why i went into this is somehow the story of india's freedom struggle never quite added up and yes you did hear you know there was a you know netaji did this and bhagat singh did that kind of thing the odd um anecdote but you always got the impression that never quite added up to anything mm. so at some point in time i began to investigate it myself uh, i'm a curious sort of chap and a completely different story began to emerge out of that um as i said it's coincidental that i am also related to some of these people and they had told me anecdotes uh but i never quite made sense of them till i really read this uh, began researching this book so you know um <clears throat> you do mention about the sanyal family you put photographs also in the book um and like they said you say that they spoke to you many of us when i been your children you know like uh, yes. grown ups telling you that yeah. oh we did this oh we did that yeah. and this is what your uncle was don't pursue it further but something must have motivated you that no i've got to you know go dig deeper into this because it's so well researched you've gone to libraries you've actually gone to those locations you've been to the jail cells some of the things that you write about the torture in the jails and all it's very 
it's very moving it's very disturbing even and the number of things uh, you know like the plots that you talk about uh, in fact there are many times where somebody came late mm-hmm. you know they were supposed to escape gaadi late pahunchi mm. and then i wonder if if only we had cell phones in those times sending location okay this is where i'm going to be and just have pick me up and i will escape in so many things that happened that went wrong so tell me when did you decide that okay these distortions were there uh, somewhere there are gaps as you say when did you decide okay i'm going to pursue this so i didn't consciously think about this start with <clears throat> do remember that before i began researching this i was already writing books so i'd already written a bunch of books and at some point in time just out of curiosity i was also reading some of the uh, these characters i some of these incidents are uh, mentioned even in uh, ocean of churn for example not in detail but i mentioned them along the way so at some point i had gathered enough material that a picture began to emerge for example um i began to get uh, bandhi jeevan sachindranath sanyal's bi- autobiography uh, into english it's not yet been published it will come out hopefully end of this year but in the very preface of that he says i'm the reason i'm writing this book because i feel that uh, a few chapters uh, of indian history uh will otherwise not be truthfully written so there is this premonition he already has that the story of the revolution will be somehow uh you know uh, swept under the carpet and, not, and or misrepresented and he felt that he had to write his own testimony mm-hmm. and so when i read that it felt like oh my god uh he's almost speaking to me uh, saying that you you know you need to go out there and write our story mm. uh, and you you've mm-hmm. written about both sides of your family yes uh in a part of the freedom struggle tell us about that so um both sides of my mother's and father's family were in the freedom struggle both of them uh, related to the uh, revolutionary the armed struggle part of the freedom struggle so my father's family they are bengali but they had settled in varanasi uh, in the late 18th century uh, there's still a neighborhood there called bengali tola and they were very famous uh, vedic scholars and over time they intermarried with a wider community of sanyas and lahiris and others who settled in that area uh, you may even have heard of lahiri mahashay who gave mm. modern kriya yoga its modern form uh, he is a great 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 grand uncle of, uh, of mine so so they were they were living there and what they did was interestingly they ran a vedic school and uh, an attached akhara mm. and as i tell you in the book this network of akharas across india really became the driving force of the anushilan samiti i e the revolutionary yeah. movement so uh, uh, just a small explainer to our guests who live uh, our listeners who live abroad what is an akhara and uh, how how what was the connection with anushilan so akharas are essentially gymnasiums you can call them but they are quasi religious gymnasiums so they're not secular places you hang out there and just do weights they were they have existed since ancient times in india uh these networks were very important to resistance to foreign invasions in the past whether it's the turks the mughals the the europeans and so on and they had been basically defanged in the course of the 19th century by the british um and sort of taken away from their quasi religious military role and increasingly s- sort of secularized into uh, sort of the gymnasiums or sports clubs what sri aurobindo does is he he dis, he he understands that this is what's happening this is the this is the turn of the 19th to the 20th century first decade of the ni- uh, of the 20th century and he says that let's convert or sort of revive this network uh, and use it to fight the british and so akharas are called different names in different parts of the country north india it's uh, it's called akhara but for example in the southern tip of india it's called a kaladi mm. or in assam it's called a hatro so mm. there is a network of these across india and has already always existed uh, young men sometimes women as well went into these akharas and you know they still exist in in more traditional parts of our cities and 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 villages um uh, varanasi it's more st- like an artistic form in many places right like kalari pet in yeah, kerala yeah but it was not historically a yeah. artistic thing mm. it was a real place to learn real martial arts for war mm. and the reason we uh, despite these um uh, uh hundreds of years of foreign occupation uh, there was always a uh, uh, some resistance going on had a lot to do with these akharas okay and the connection with anushilan samiti 
Anushilan Samiti basically is, is this is the name by which, by the way, the revolutionaries call themselves. And why do they call themselves with a strange name? Because Anushilan Samiti literally means the discipline committee. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that's because this is all. These, this is actually a network of these akharas, mm. where these young men, sometimes women as well, would uh, basically meet each other, and these revolutionary ideas would spread. So this is what the revolutionary movement called it, the Anushilan Samiti. And of course, my family were involved in this Akharas, both. So this is my father's family, as I said. The Varanasi. In the Varanasi, they're running Bengali Tola, which means it's a basically a Bengali school. Hmm. There's still a Bengali Tola intercollege there set up by my family. And attached to that, there were these Akharas, which they also ran. So this is one branch of the family, and this branch included people like Sachindranath Sanyal, of course, very famously. But many of his cousins, brothers, the whole family were uh, involved in this movement. And some of them I mentioned in the book. Yeah. Uh, some of them I hint to. I, I actually didn't mention everybody because then it would begin sounding, sounding too much like a family history. Mm. Um, so that's my uh, father's family. And they were then thrown out of Varanasi and the, all their properties were confiscated around about 1927. By the British. By the British as a result of the um, the Kakodi conspiracy. And of course, Sachin Sanyal is sent off to Kalapani for the second time. To cellular jail. To cellular jail. But um, what happens is that my branch of the family ends up in uh, what is now Prayagraj but then called Lahabad. And of course, there is a link to um, what happens then uh, in Allahabad as well? It be becomes a hub of uh, revolutionary activity. You also talk about the, the that it was so traumatic that nobody ever from the Sanyal family lived in Varanasi again or something like that. To that no, extent. it was not so much traumatic. We were just thrown out, so sure. we didn't have anywhere to go back to. So, so nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but the, it, that whole process when he was sent to cellular jail was difficult. Absolutely at that time. difficult because everybody just uprooted and thrown out. Thrown out. Uh, uh, right. And. Then different people made their way. Another branch went off to Gorakhpur, by the way. So and so on and so. In some sense, uh, that uh, family then sort of dispersed. This one part, I'm going to come to this, which I had taken out, and you know, it. He says, nonetheless, uh, Sanyal's main concern was to find. I'm reading it out. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, Sanyal's main concern was to find a way to free the remaining political prisoners from cellular jail, in particular Bhai Parmanand and Vinayak Savarkar. Yes. So then he goes and he says uh, he met uh, with Madan Mohal Malviya, gave him a patient hearing, but didn't offer any concrete. He gets disappointed. Sanyal gets disappointed. Then he goes to meet Jawaharlal Nehru in Gorakhpur. After hearing him out, Nehru commented, quote, At a time when we are planning to go to jail, you want us to help others come out of prison? This comment stunned Sanyal. Yes. And then he goes to Lala Lajpat Rai. He met uh, Lala Lajpat Rai offers unconditional support. So here was your ancestor who was going pillar to post trying to get people out of cellular jail because he had experienced it. Whereas the others who were the moderates, so-called moderates, they hadn't experienced that trauma. Absolutely. So Sachin Sanyal, um, uh, basically, uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he's my uh, grand uncle, uh, not my grandfather. Uh, he... Uh, comes back from cellular jail. He is then, um, one of the things he wants to do is to free all those people back that he has left behind. By the way, he describes how he ra felt somewhat guilty of being actually freed. Yeah, the survivor's guilt. Yeah, so survivor's guilt. And he comes back and he's trying to explain to people that, look, cellular jail is not like any other jail. They are literally torturing people on a daily basis to break them. Yeah. Uh, they're working them to death. They are electrocuting them. They're just behaving atrociously with them. This is not like being sell, sent off to the luxury wing of Naini uh, jail or uh, something like that. Where you have books and, and books and you're, you can listen to parrots and everything. Yes, and, uh, you know, or play badminton and other things. This is a serious place uh, where you get tortured on a daily basis. Yeah. And then he suddenly realizes that nobody quite gets this. That, you know, cellular jail is, 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 uh, 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 is a totally different uh, ball game as a prison. And uh, so... He's trying, in, in that passage, he's trying to basically uh, incite uh, some sort of a movement to try and free all these other people. Uh, but um, nobody seems to be listening to it. And finally, in 1920, he goes to the Nagpur session and where he is able to yeah. uh, sort of uh, uh, make a call for uh, freeing some of them. And um, hmm. uh, not particularly su successfully, because I think Savarkar, it takes several more years for Savarkar to be uh, allowed to return to the mainland. 
many more years before he's actually freed yeah. uh, and so on so that savarkar uh, what you write about savarkar is also very moving the mm-hmm. torture that he faced mm-hmm. and all i mean so many have written about uh, you know what about savarkar's life but every time i read something it it's a new facet to the man anyway we spoke about your dad side of the family let's go to the mom side of the family now so my mom's side of the family my mother's father's family interestingly their sort of uh, they were the, the surname is chakravarti and my great great grandfather uh, was a gentleman called mohini mohan chakravarti mohini mohan chakravarti's uh, revolt against the british was actually to set up a cotton mill hmm. and in in uh, uh, this is following east pakistan uh, this is now I- in bangladesh uh in a place called kushtia uh they it was it was at one stage one of the largest mills uh cotton mills in asia called mohini mills how is it a rebellion it was a rebellion because he actually set it up um as a part of the uh, uh attempt to create indigenous industries uh following the 1905 uh, uh swadeshi andolan now why i want to make this point is quite interesting is you see the word swadeshi has ended up being utilized as uh, uh, later on uh, by gandhi ji uh, to as some sort of a return to the past to a pre modern uh, utopia but the original idea of swadeshi was actually to be modern rapid modernization mm. and so there were many uh, indians but specifically bengalis who went out there and began to uh, sort of attempt to create new modern uh, indian enterprises So Mohini Mills was an attempt to do exactly that and he was very very successful it's a different matter it fell on the wrong side of the border and then so this is another interpretation of certain concepts yes. that uh, that had a very linear explanation as far as like you said yes. about swadeshi yes. that it was uh, we were told uh, in our history texts mm. in schools was that it was this go back to the simplicity of wearing unstitched cloth and weaving your own uh cloth but it wasn't that Absol- no it's e- exactly the opposite. opposite because the original uh, proponents of this line of thought by the way they all linked to the revolutionary movement because le- the revolutionaries remember are modernists uh yeah. they are not attempting to go back to uh, uh, feudal india and the old nobility or whatever it is they're entirely about moving forward to a democratic republic and they're all about modernizing uh, savarkar or Uh, Sri Aurobindo or you, Sachin Sanyal, they are all modernizers, and so this too is a form of rebellion. Mm. And then there is also my mother's mother's family, which is even more closely linked to this whole thing, is my great grandfather Nalin Aksha Sanyal and his brother Anadi Kanta Sanyal. They were members of the Anushilan Samiti, and then specifically how are they Sanyals? Because my mother's mother's family. Ah, they were okay. They were also Sanyal. So this Chakravarti and Sanyal. Yes, your mother's mother. Yeah, and they're not related. Okay. They just have the same surname. Okay. Uh, and he, they came from Nadia, by the way. Hmm. Um, so uh, there is a there's a village there still called Doradaho. So they came from that village. Okay. Uh, the village boys, and they uh, they were academically good, so ended up in Kolkata, and. Uh, uh, Onadi Kanto Sanyal and Nalinaksha Sanyal that got got involved. in an attempt to take out the uh, kolkata uh, um, uh, uh, intelligence the police intelligence service led by a gentleman called tegart and so they carried out a bunch of assassinations and anadi kanto got captured he was beaten to death in rangpur jail and then died from his injuries uh, nalinaksha of course carried on for some time being a part of bagajotin's uh, jugantor group and then later on he would uh, be brought into the congress by c r das um but he always had this sort of a uh, uh, linkages through to the revolutionaries uh, and that's why he eventually also became very close to netaji mm. because netaji also had that sort of tilt so the the book has a, a whole lot of this thing you know mm. um these conversations and these linkages that you talk about um in an era where there were communication was so hard it was so hard because uh, there were no cell phones and there were no telephones mm. um so of course uh, all that was in there and then the intelligence network of the british absolutely you talk about how you know everything there were informers collaborators who who just informed the brits and then those guys were sent off to cellular jail it was like oh, okay they're going if to they do were something they were lucky they were otherwise hanged or hanged, shot dead <laughs> hanged and shot dead yeah, yeah. that part is uh, very disturbing 
to yeah. know that there were these collaborators and i can sense uh, you know reading it that there's come another book coming on these collaborators so tell me about that when you were researching it did you did it come as a shock to you it came as a shock to me when i was reading it but when you were researching it it didn't come as a shock i mean as i said i grew up in an environment where some of this stuff was always murmured around huh. so uh, and so you know uh, I would be told that so and so person may be a great guy now, but this is his real history, so mm. that kind of thing. So, you know, I had, I always had that kind of murmurings around me. Uh, but what I have done here is, as politely as possible, mentioned a few of them. Do remember that many of them and their descendants are still leading uh, lights of our uh, current elite. So I didn't want to unnecessarily provoke that as and and sort of take the conversation too far in that direction and then become controversial for a different reason. uh but uh, you know fact of the matter is that after independence mm, the revolutionaries were deliberately uh, pushed out of the national uh, power structures narratives and everything so i have to come back to what you're saying what you're saying is that the revolutionaries their contribution was erased and the collaborators they are still part of the elite in india now absolutely okay elaborate please So what the interesting thing is India becomes independent uh it becomes independent because of a number of uh, uh, sort of efforts it included various branches of the congress congress was not just a monolithic uh, party even the revolutionaries were inside the congress it, uh, in many places and of course the revolutionary movement there are many other movements as well but at the time of independence however the revolutionaries first of all did not have any senior leaders all their senior leaders had been killed or had died for very variety of reasons or gone missing in the, as in the case of netaji in addition to that remember what happens to them the two provinces that provided the most revolutionaries punjab and bengal actually get partitioned mm -hmm. uh lahore very important hub of uh, revolutionary activity uh, dhaka and east bengal So all these revolutionaries, far from thinking about grabbing power in Delhi, are you know suddenly homeless. Uh, so they're rushing around. Their properties are being taken. Their women are being raped. Their houses are being burned down. So they have completely different concerns. And then one branch of the uh, Congress Party ultimately consolidates power, which is the Nehruvian branch. And in the 1950s, they. i have to say and this this is not just about you know the human uh, sort of uh, thing about trying to in, in, increase the uh, importance of your own uh, contributions uh, the nehruvians go out of their way to actually wipe out the memory of other branches of resistance to the british particularly the revolutionaries so for example the cellular jail was almost entirely pulled down it's oh, the oh, bits that you see today are just two radials the rest was pulled down and even these two radials were almost pulled down uh, just in order to remove all systematically remove all places of uh, importance and memorials to the revolutionaries but why they were not in they were not uh, they were dead gone they no but the revol movement was still there it involved hundreds of thousands of people i mean do remember the revolutionaries were capable of winning elections inside the congress in the 1930s mm. uh, against the gandhians uh the gandhians were of course uh, this moderate extremist bit yeah that's that been going coming. on for a long time yeah. uh, or so they could have uh, used they, up yes power. they were not a or, trivial thing they the the problem that they faced was they had no unifying force so they got scattered across from the left to the right hmm. uh, the communists on the left to the rss on the right and and many many branches of the congress themselves so what happens is that the nehruvian branch of the uh, congress essentially comes to power and they need allies and who are their allies are the existing power structure made up of the collaborators they <clears throat> so suddenly the same people say uh, the imperial police service officers who were f f ordering firings against uh, freedom fighters uh, suddenly they are the people who actually get promoted up when the british leave in fact in many cases the british don't even leave so it it up to 1958 they become part of the civil service you mean they were part of the civil service okay. in many cases mm. to start with if the imperial civil service was mostly made up of indians by the 1930s and 1940s yeah uh, so the imperial police service uh, that ordered firing in mumbai hmm. uh during the uh, naval revolt 
uh, were mostly Indians, mm. uh, and and uh, all the contractors and others who were part of the um, uh, uh, British establishment, they actually were beneficiaries when the British left because they all got promoted up. And the, you talk about that. You put pictures also of that naval revolt. Not many people know. I incidentally uh, trivia, but I was born there in Navy Nagar, and. And None nobody tells you. Nobody, nobody tells you that, that the single most important event that led to Indian freedom is the naval revolt of 1946. There is a very small memorial to it, and it's only 19, uh, in uh, 2022 that the navy actually celebrated it uh, with a flotilla, uh, with a float uh, in uh, Republic Day. Yeah. So, what happens is that the collaborator class. Do you remember that they, at Independence they are panicking? Because in every other country, like in Indonesia and other countries, they are usually evicted out of the power structure. Hmm. Naturally, they were the people who were carrying Drain the up. swamp. Yeah, drain the swamp. But in India, what happens in the name of continuity, hmm. and maybe one can say there was some need for continuity, but what happens is they are allowed to continue. Hmm. And in fact, they get promoted because, as I said, as the British leave. And, as a, and, and also the British don't always leave. Uh, till 1958, the naval chief is British. Hmm. That's why even after independence, um, the nav Navy flag yeah. continued to have the uh, cross of St. George. George. So, <clears throat> these things continue. So, the, those power structures continue. Hmm. And of course, they have already, they are, they are incumbents in many ways. And they, they, they know English. Uh, the, oh. the, uh, they, so, they have also the links with uh, uh, outside world as well. So as I say, there was no truth commission. There, there was, was no, no truth inquiry. commission. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. So, these guys continue. In fact, they go out of their way to push out people who are um, not from their ilk. So, the intellectual class, the first two generations of intellectual class in India, hmm. or the elite, uh, other than some people made from the Nehruvian Congress, to be fair, the Nehruvian Congress had contributed to, hmm. The, hmm. to the freedom struggle. Hmm. But other than them, the, the, the hangers on around just shift from collaborating with the British to collaborating with the new Nehruvian elite. But the Nehruvian elite is, of course, just one branch of the Congress. It's very small. So the rest of the elite actually come, is drawn from, the new elite is actually drawn from this uh, collaborator class. Have they gone away, fizzled out, or do you... No, they're that? all, uh, they were, they are still around in many ways. They are uh, around. They are still around. Uh, it, it, it requires uh, just a... Uh, very little scratch uh, the surface scratch the surface a little bit of go uh, googling will tell you the uh, ancestry of many of these people so it's okay not uh, so uh, we leave that for your next book sanjeev but you know you were talking about how the revolutionaries kind of melted away uh, because their properties went away with the partition you know there's not much of documentation about the trauma that happened with the east pakistan there's a lot about the west punjab and the east punjab division and the trauma that happened there but not much of literature which is there or popular films and things made on that but there was that too you talked about how they had uh, you know the trauma the, the in your epilogue you know i read about the ptsd part uh, post traumatic stress disorder many of them had and there was this one part which I'm just going to read out some parts of it uh, where you talked about um, the maharashtran brahmin community yes when Nathuram Godse was assassinated, then it unleashed a wave of mob violence against the Brahmin community across Maharashtra. Estimates vary, but thousands of homes and businesses were burnt down and hundreds were killed. You know, when I read this, uh, uh, Sanjeev, I asked several friends of mine and all, did you know this? Many of them are married to Maharashtrans. Many of them, you know, have, I come from Bombay. We've lived am among, nobody knew about it. It's not because they were ill-informed or anything. It's just that it wasn't there in the school text. So then... It also, is also, what happens, just with partition families, they'll tell you, partition families tend to say very little about the yes. moment of partition because it's such a major trauma. True. They very often don't tell their children what they went through very clearly or very passingly they will mention it because they want to wipe it out of them. Yes. So the same thing happened with the Maharashtrian Brahmins. Another community that provided a lot of revolutionaries, incidentally. Yeah. Uh, and um, when a member of their community assassinated Gandhiji, and I'm not condoning in any way that was the right thing. It was the wrong thing to have done. But what followed was also wrong, and it's never talked about, which is this massive rioting against the Maharashtrian Brahmin community, where 
Um, as I said, hundreds were killed, yeah. thousands of homes, businesses, etc., were burnt down. Uh, Savarkar's brother Narayan was dragged out of his house and stoned to death. I mean, yeah. eventually died. And it was a Congress mob. It was, and this is why it you is important. That. He yes. says that uh, a large mob of Congress party workers turned up at the home of Narayan Rao Savarkar, dragged him out on the streets. They beat and stoned him mercilessly before leaving him in a pool of blood. And then he says, and then you write about how they went looking for Vinayak Savarkar at his house in Dadar. This is there by others of also, but it's it's still you know disturbing where he was staying with his wife Yamuna and son Vishwas on the first floor. As the mob stormed into the ground floor, they were delayed long enough by a couple of supporters to allow the police to arrive. This likely saved the family from meeting the same fate as Narayan Rao. And then you write about PTSD and having suffered years of torture in prison and then partition, many former revolutionaries suffer from what we today call post-traumatic stress disorder. And then you write about Ulaskar Dutt. Now, I want you to... I mean, this was, of course, that he was so severely tortured in cellular jail that he almost lost his mind. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about repeated electrocutions. And when those electrocutions were happening, he was thinking about Leela. Yes, so I'll tell you the story. Now yes. tell me the story about Leela because it is heartbreaking. So, Ulaskar Dutt was the uh, expert bomb maker in the first generation of the Anushilan Samiti. And after the Alipur bomb case, um, 1909, 1910, he's sent off to Kalapani. Now, as I told you, cellular jail wasn't just any old jail. It was designed to break people. Hmm. Uh, and there were hundreds of these revolutionaries and they were systematically put through torture, mental and physical. Now, after several years there, obviously, Ulaskar Dutt's health broke down and he was severely ill at some point in time, running high fever. And he simply refused to run the oil mill, which was one of the ways they would force uh, physical labor on them. And so uh, the jail warden uh, 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 and his accomplices, uh, you know, said, no, he's just putting on an act, uh, which is odd. You could always tell that somebody is running high fever. Anyway, so they drag him off and they begin to electrocute him. They tie him to a chair and they are electrocuting him and he's screaming. And the rest of the jail can hear him screaming. And by the way, this is deliberate because he's being made an example of, right? So it's not like they, the British want to hide this. They want the rest of the prisoners to hear. And and he keeps, he, through the electrocution, he keeps collapsing. So they wait for him to revive and again put him through this. And eventually he loses his mind. From, after days and days of going through electrocution, he loses his mind. The other prisoners, by the way, go on hunger strike and so on. And so finally, when the news of all of this begins to leak out, uh, the British authorities decide, okay, we'll let him off, but he's lost his mind. So they send him off to um, uh, to Madras, uh, uh, now Chennai, uh, to a, a mental asylum to uh, recover. But it takes him many, many years to recover. Now, why, while he's doing all of this, do remember what is happening. What is keeping him sane? The image of Leela. So who is Leela? Leela was his college sweetheart, who was the daughter of Bipin Pal, Another very famous nationalist. Bal, Lal Bal Lal Pal. Lal Bal Pal uh, 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 era leader. Uh, so he's the Pal of the Lal Bal Pal. And was his classmate. And they were engaged to get married when he was arrested on the Alipur jail case. And <clears throat> so throughout all this torture, he sees this drifting image of Leela in front of him. Uh, and that's what sort of keeps, that's the only thing that keeps him going through these years of uh, first torture in jail, then this electrocution, this, uh, this period of mental instability and all of that. And so he comes out after many, many years uh, when he recovers enough and goes looking for Leela. Hmm. And of course, he finds that Leela... Which year are we talking about? Man? We are talking now uh, many Post years... Post-independence. No, no, oh. they are still well in the independence, maybe okay. maybe in the early 1920s. Oh, still okay, in the yeah, 90s. yeah, correct. So... Huh. so he goes off looking for uh, Leela. And Leela, of course, had waited for him for many years, but he had gone off to cellular jail, no communications. He, she was unaware of all the tortures he went through. She was unaware what happened to him afterwards. And so after waiting for many years, she then de decided maybe she had died or whatever. And she had married somebody else and was living in Bombay, now Mumbai. So, uh, Ullas Kardat is obviously... Uh, you know, sad, but what can he do? So he sort of drifts back and he, you know, he still rejoins the revolutionary movement after all of this. 
gets arrested, does various things. And then at the time of independence uh, and partition, he's living in, in his village in East uh, Bengal, in East Pakistan, and he becomes a refugee. So when he sort of becomes a refugee and he, he moves to uh, now independent India, somebody tells him that Leela is now a widow and is paralyzed from waist down. So he hunts her down in Bombay and finds her, takes him with her to uh, Assam, Silchar, where uh, his family or he uh, sets up uh, his home, new home, and uh, marries her. And then looks after her till she dies. Wow. So eventually she did marry her. What a love story, right? I mean, Absolutely. And I... you could not have made this up. Yeah. I mean, if, if I did this in a movie, it, uh, it would yeah. people think it's just not believable. But this is a true story. I know. So, uh, you know, in the beginning of the book, uh, when you mentioned him and you said that more about their love later. So I was like, where is this going to come in? And then it comes right at the epilogue. It was very touching. Uh, there's also the story of Bina Das. Tell us about that before I go to Komaga tomorrow. Bina Das was uh, the uh, one of the daughters of uh, Beni Madhav Das, who was, by the way, the teacher of Netaji, uh, and one of the reasons Netaji went in the nationalistic uh, sort of stream. Mm. So now Bina Das, uh, uh, incidentally, used to uh, practice uh, uh, shooting in what is now Hindustan Park area in Baliganj in Kolkata with my great-grandmom, that's Nani Naksha Sanyal's wife. Mm. And they used to shoot regularly. Um, and um, uh, uh, and then was this common? Tell me for women to go for. Well, I doubt that was common <laughs> enough. But I do remember these are not common people. They are they're clearly not. they are yeah. they are they are both uh, Nalinaksha Sanyal and Bina Das's father were both linked to the revolutionaries. Uh, they were not and and you know so they 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 were they were probably routinely handling various kinds of guns and bombs. And That's what like I was that. going to ask. You know, how did it work for these women? The the, the reason I'm asking Bina's story is because of that that. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, pe to party mein jao to mom will say, what time are you coming back? What time are you going? But these women were going about, you know. Uh, well, I can tell you, my great, my great grandfather was uh, was not quite an uh, uh, ordinary person. I mean, he yeah. was himself involved in, in uh, um, you know, various revolutionary activities. And how emancipated and a, that they wanted their women also. They didn't put their women in, uh, you know, at the back of the room and say, cook Incidentally, for us. since I knew my great grandmother, Okay. who we used to call Mamuni. Uh, she was quite a formidable uh, lady. She was, I think, five foot nothing. <laughs> but uh, uh, possibly the only person Nalinaksha Sanyal was afraid of. Okay. <laughs> she okay. was quite uh, quite a character. So huh. uh, so it's not completely out of character that she was out there practicing shooting with Bina Das. <laughs> okay. But anyway, Bina Das then goes off on, uh, on, uh, on graduation day uh, in Calcutta University. Uh, 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 he, she pulls out this revolver and shoots five bullets at the governor uh, of mm. Bengal mm. Uh, and uh, uh, misses. But she's arrested, of course, and sent off to jail for nine years. Um, my uh, great-grandmom, of course, would claim that uh, if she had been the one shooting, it, she would uh, not have missed. <laughs> uh, now, that is, of course, a very troubling idea because if that had happened, I may not have existed either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, That's true. I'm going to read out this one portion uh, when we talk about the Gadarites. You know, you say this, that the whole episode, you talk about the Komagatomaru and, you know, bringing the the uh, Grand Sahib on the, you know, he carried it on his head and things. And you said that the whole episode uh, sent shockwaves, you know, because of what happened then. I'm not going to go into the details about that, what that Komagatomaru incident is. You can, people can Google it and read it if you have not read it before. You write about this and you say that the whole episode sent shockwaves uh, across India and the diaspora. Uh, in Canada, a group of Gadarites decided to kill those they suspected of working for British intelligence. One by one, their bodies were found. This included Arjun Singh, uh, then there's Bela Singh, uh, then you talk about uh, Meva Singh. A Gadarite pulled out a gun and shot him dead. Meva was immediately arrested. Condemned to death, Bela would survive a couple of more assassination attempts in Canada uh, before being killed in Punjab later. Tell me about this whole Gadarites and what happened then and their links, uh, you know, the links of what happened in that period to the origins of the Khalistanis in Canada. So, uh, all this while we were talking about the uh, revolutionaries within India, but do remember the revolutionaries were spread all over 
all over the world. They had links to foreign governments like the Germans, the Turks, the Japanese, to other freedom movements like those of uh, the Irish. And <clears throat> they were operating in places like uh, the west coast of Canada and the US, California and British Columbia. And in, in uh, British Columbia and, uh, uh, and Canada, uh, they functioned through a network of Gurudwaras. Like in India, they were functioning through a network of Akharas. In North America, they were functioning through a network of Gurudwaras, where there were a, a group of nationalist Sikhs, Punjabis more generally, but specifically uh, Sikhs, who were uh, sort of pushing for Indian freedom. They were providing financing. They were personally willing to pick up arms and move to India and doing all kinds of things were going on. And remember the context as well, a significant proportion of those fighting in the First World War for the British cause in Europe were Sikhs. So this was not a, just, you know, another, just yet another community that was mm -hmm. uh, involved in all of this. There, so there was this simmering tension. And, the, and of course, the British intelligence, yet again, was fully aware that, you know, this was a dangerous thing from their perspective. So what they did is interesting. They got hold of a secret agent uh, called Hopkinson. And Hopkinson began to infiltrate these Gurudwaras in British Columbia. And he was given a huge amount of resources to essentially find out loyalist Sikhs, particularly those who were willing to use these resources he was giving to create first a wedge between the Hindu uh, uh, community and, uh, and, and, the, and the more uh, hardcore Sikh uh, uh, community. And so you've... Till that point in time, the Hindu Sikh community was basically indistinguishable. It was more a spectrum than, than clearly separate. And so you see that begin to happen uh, in, um, in the UK, but more importantly in Canada. Canada. And so, of course, the Gadarites were aware that this was going on. And so they begin to shoot, out, uh, shoot the, uh, these informers and British agents in, in their midst. And there are these gunfights in the Gurudwaras. Ultimately, what happens is that um, Bela Singh, who was one of the collaborators, mm -hmm. he uh, panics and he shoots a bunch of uh, Gadarites uh, inside a Gurudwara in British Columbia. And he's captured. Uh, the British cannot hang him and punish him because he is one of theirs. So they do a show trial. And everybody knows that Bela Singh uh, is going to be released at the end of the show trial. Um, so the court happens and Hopkinson turns up to give testimony on his behalf. Uh, but while he is about to do this, another uh, Sikh, uh, 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 Gadarite, pulls out a revolver and shoots um, him dead. And then he also attempts to kill Bela Singh, but he doesn't manage. Anyway, Mewa Singh hmm. uh, is captured. He's hanged. Uh, sadly, nobody remembers Mewa Singh in India. But he was, you know, uh, he basically, uh, in my view, should be celebrated. He died him. in Punjab much later. Right? No, Mewa yeah. Singh didn't. Mewa. He was hanged. He was hanged. Huh? He was hanged. Bela Singh, the collaborator. Collaborator. He, Bela Singh, however, found that it was too dangerous to be for him to be in Canada because there were all these Gadarite Sikhs hunting for him. He decides then that it's actually better for him to go back to Punjab, where it's actually safer, hmm. where he can sort of disappear in the woodwork uh, among the general population. But even there, he's hunted down by the revolutionaries and killed. Um, but what happens as a result of this is that there is this, um, uh, this group of uh, British loyalist Sikhs who slowly take control of the Gurudwaras uh, uh, with British support, both in Canada and in the UK. Hmm. And uh, this idea of Khalistani movement, interestingly, even today, uh, comes from exactly those same Gurudwaras that had been infiltrated with Hopkinson 100 years ago. Oh. So this is the source of your Khalistani movement. So in case you're wondering... Why on earth would Canada be the center of Khalistani movement of, you know, of all places on earth? Well, this is the reason. And also the UK as well. Same reason. So there's a hi historical contextual yes. connection between these. Absolutely. And But didn't the Gurdwaras, didn't the people then want to weed away these uh, elements in their Gurdwaras? No, so this tussle continued, as I said. This was a mm. brutal tussle. Mm. But in the end, I mean, this, this, uh, this tussle still remains. I mean, it's still there. 
at your book release event in new delhi uh, the home minister said that and i quote this india's independence is a collective result of efforts but one sided narrative uh, was imposed on the masses through education legends and writing of history and he also said we have to extract history from the streams of extremists versus moderates and make it realistic what is realistic uh, sanjeev because the uh, there are many who are saying that there's a lot of rewriting which is happening and it is pandering to a narrative now it's a populist narrative so my view is that look let the facts all come out hmm. everybody is allowed an opinion hmm. but you you're not allowed your own facts whatever i've written in my book are very easily verifiable i've given uh, resources at its references at the back you can check those out or you can go and do your own research you will find that they are completely and solidly backed by facts uh, i mean you can quibble about the things on the edges but the broad narrative that i have put together in this book is and and in other books as well has never been um, overturned by anybody mm -hmm. so my view is i am not saying that the peaceful movement led by mahatma gandhi had no role in our freedom struggle that is not the case i have therefore not called this book the alternative story i've called it the other story hmm. by which i'm saying that look yes there was a non violent movement but there was this other armed struggle as well which was an important part of our history we should know about it and all these amazing people who gave their lives fighting for uh, our uh, our freedoms so you know um what happens is that uh, these the new interpretations which are coming out are digging up things which nobody remembers or it was deliberately done which you mention j sai deepak mentions vikram sampat and many other historians the new age historians they are saying that it was deliberately done what happens also it's that religious identities come into clash over these historic narratives now i can give you if it could be about the mughals it could be about tipu sultan and now when elections come then it's it's resurrected again so was there a deliberate attempt that let's not let's put bandaid over all this because it it's just going to cause well it, it you know putting bandaid doesn't help what was the history was history this is what the facts are lying about them doesn't help at all i mean just to give you an example um there is no evidence that tipu sultan was fighting for indian independence i mean he was going quite happy to write letters to uh, the turkish sultan asking for help uh, so he's asking for uh, you know help from all kinds of foreign uh, groups and the people he was fighting were not only the british he was fighting the nizam he was fighting the marathas he was fighting the travancore more than adequate evidence um that he was uh, doing atrocities against fellow indians very little evidence that he was fighting for indian independence so if your purpose is to look for muslim patriots then let me put some others uh, why not ashfaqullah khan yeah. right here is a man who gave his he was part of the hindustan republican association uh, and was hanged for the kakuri case so the problem here is that if you really want to dig in you will find all kinds of other things as well but this peculiar skewed narrative it doesn't really help because it doesn't convince anyone even a mild scratching of the surface of history shows you that these narratives are false it's like um, when they talk about mughals is in you nobody celebrates dara shiko where is not just that i mean we start with this utter absurdity of trying to celebrate uh, 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 babar was indian because he died here and did not go, take our money and go away well he actually wanted to he couldn't find his way back to central asia he was road road was blocked and for many generations after that the mughals did try to make their way back by the way an expedition was led even by aurangzeb when he was a prince to try and make their way back to bukhara so <laughs> and that they didn't come here to loot and plunder they he, came here to so make this to civilize us or something but this is absurd you read Uh, Tuzuki Barbary I or uh, Babar Nama in Persian uh, and Babar is absolutely clear why he came to India he came for the gold he says so himself so you see what happens here is that two things one is this is false and it doesn't cut any ice secondly what you have done here uh, it, and uh, is that you have then painted the idea that the, the their muslim identity overrides everything else and that somehow indian Muslims of today must somehow identify with 
uh, Babur because he was a Muslim. Mm. Now, this is a very dangerous line of thought. So let me explain why. This is exactly the mistake that Mahatma Gandhi did during the Khilafat movement. What was he doing? He was basically asking Muslims to join the freedom struggle, not on the basis of their freedom, but on the basis of their Islamic, allegiance, allegiance to Islamic the linkages. Turkish uh, mm. caliph, a Turkish sultan, who was also considered the a caliph. So the point I'm making is that this, this is a very slippery slope. And I think it is unnecessarily foisted on the uh, uh, Indian Muslim, I don't, you, who but most of them are descendants of Indians, not of uh, Turkic invaders. Hmm. But it's it's something that Pakistan did, right? When they were doing their history. Narration. So they have done it. Hmm. So they have done this absurd thing. You know, they name their missiles after Ghori and uh, Ghazni, Ghazni and, and so on. Now this is crazy because read your own history. Your own great, great, great grandfather, grandmother were killed, raped, etc. by these people. Hmm. Um, so, uh, why are you celebrating? This is a you know bizarre form of Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, is is a there's also this talk that because of these new narratives which are coming, that uh, Indian academia is confused, uh, conflicted. Uh, is the architecture of Indian academia so weak that it can't take on these? multiple narratives now? Well, there was a longish period when uh, it, well, uh, there was sort of an ethnic cleansing of alternative narratives in Indian academia. Interesting. Uh, okay. So, uh, and by the way, this has happened around the world, the world. I mean, the amount of ideological diversity even in Western universities is sure. just, uh, you know, ridiculous. It's, but you still have the odd uh, thinker who may not confirm conform uh, and uh, but in India it was uh, absolute uh, complete cleansing hmm. and this started from the 1950s uh, you saw you know in the economics field for example you had the likes of B.R. Shinoi I just pushed out because he didn't he wanted more market -based. In the, you wanted to yeah you wanted there. to bring in this somewhat uh, uh, entirely socialist kind of thing so and you see that also in the history writing uh, R.C. Majumdar is pushed out uh, uh, from being the chairman of the uh, writer uh, of the official history of... His books uh, were not available for a long, long time. Yes. So, you know, y this this was done in a neat and clean way. And since there were nobody in academia over, over a period of time that completely cleaned it out, the only way you will get alternative narratives now is from outside of academia. Of course, now new people may emerge over time. But, the you know, I, I and... Uh, uh, Vikram and Sai, etc., always criticized, you know, but you are not a trained historian. Well, if I was subjected to that training, I would have been brainwashed. Basically, what you are objecting to is that I didn't get subjected to the same amount of brainwashing. That's maybe why I'm able to write outside of, outside of the official narratives. But a massive system of brainwashing uh, in the name of sort of historiography and, uh, and of course, patronage systems in terms of papers and seminars and doctorates, etc. was uh, uh, that machinery was created. That machinery, by and large, is to a large extent still alive. Mm. Uh, but what is happening is that outside of that controlled environment, other narratives are popping up. So now that we're talking about your other hats and how it's held against you, so let's get on to that. You're a numbers person. Yes. So how did you, why did you... Uh, Abandon that? Have you abandoned that? No, your regular job is that. Yes. So, tell me, give me some gyan now on this bank collapse which has happened. How safe is Indian money, especially of the startups? And how can India prevent this kind of a thing happening here? What's happening with the Silicon Valley Bank? I'm presuming that's what you mean. Yes. And, and, and the other smaller banks that have yes, also gone bank. under yeah. in, uh, as we speak in the US. Um this is precisely what we were warning the world about, including the U.S. So you go back to the COVID period and you will see uh, leading uh, economists, including some who have won Nobel Prizes like Stiglitz and uh, Krugman and, of course, many NRI economists based in the West, telling us, go out there and spend helicopter money, monetary and fiscal expansion, it does not matter, and so on. And you will remember that... Uh, 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 many of us who were in government and myself personally, we were continuously saying, bad idea. Mm. This is not a demand side shock to start with. This is a supply side shock. And 
pushing in all this uh, fiscal and uh, monetary uh, sort of uh, resources in, in this massive burst is going to create bubbles. So what has happened is, first of all, many, you know, many uh, uh, developing countries have gone under, Pakistan or Egypt or Sri Lanka and so on. But even developed countries have ended up with massive debts and also this rush of liquidity in then created all this dislocation in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the Silicon Valley Bank as one example of it. What happened? They got a lot of money. They didn't know what to do with this. So they put them, I, I can't believe they did it, very frankly. They mm. stuffed them into long uh, bonds. Uh, bonds. Now, anybody who has even done the first undergraduate class of any bond mats in their finance, uh, you know, uh, in finance, uh, uh, when they're doing their finance course, will know that uh, any increases in interest rates will lead the bonds to crash. Collapse, yes. And the longer the bonds, the uh, worse that crash is going to be. I mean, if they were forced to do something with that money, maybe put it in very short-term bonds or whatever, uh, of short-term uh, instruments of some sort. So instead, they put them in these 10-year treasuries. Mm. And inevitably, when interest rates went back, the, the, the prices of those bonds mm. collapsed and they essentially they went bankrupt. Yeah. Now, this is, you know, this is uh, really toddler-level... Uh, mistake. Uh, and I can't believe this happened. But do remember that we were being advised to do this here in India. Mm. And in some ways, this is in a slightly different way, is what we actually did do uh, following the uh, financial crisis, crisis. Okay. Of, of 2007 that, 8. Yeah. Uh, we had gone out there and done this massive amount of lending, and it had created bubbles, um, and it had led to all kinds of NPAs in our system, which, uh, you know, uh, I was part of the team that went through it in 17, 18, 19, cleaning it up. Hmm. So what I'm trying to say here is that we were being advised to do things would would have inevitably led to exactly the things you are now seeing in the US hmm. and in Europe and other countries uh, and the UK. Uh, all of them now have extremely constrained fiscal uh, systems. They don't know what to do because they already committed so much resources, hmm. massively uh, uh, over-indebted, Inflation that is not in control. They're trying to control it by uh, tightening monetary policy, but their banking system now cannot suddenly take this tightening. So, yeah. you know, one of the important lessons here is never lose track of mon uh, macroeconomic stability. And you know, in the in it's it, and and the true test of uh, economic character is being able to hold uh, it together when you are under severe stress. And I think we passed that test. The true test. Why didn't the ratings agencies, why did they give them A ratings and stuff like that? The bank. This is a common problem. And this happened because of two reasons. Uh, the first reason is often more uh, 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 sort of played up is that their incentive structure is to give everybody a very high rating because then, you know, the pay person who gets rated pays, so mm. you want to give them the best rating possible. And so there's an incentive structure problem. Mm. And there is a lot of debate about the agency problem, incentive structures, etc. But my view, this is only one part of the problem. The other part of the problem, a more severe problem, is that even if you sorted out all these agency problems, it wouldn't uh, do anything, is that frankly, the future is unknowable. Mm. So therefore, what you need to do is to create buffers in the system in various ways and really look through their, uh, to their, uh, through, through their uh, uh, balance sheets and stress test them over and over again. And that, that is unfortunately not done uh, very much. So it's not the case just that the, you know, that the rating agencies are, have an incentive problem. Many cases, they genuinely don't know what's happening. Hmm. And so... But that's their job. That's Fine. their job, but they don't do a good job of it. And I have written extensively on why, unfortunately, we end up using taking these ratings way too seriously and hardwiring it into a policy. Hmm. So now what happens in these situations is suddenly everybody's ratings go down. So you have to force capital onto it in the banking system. That causes further tightening and so on and so forth. So instead, the ratings now become pro-cyclical. Hmm. So just when you need more capital is when you are having these ro ro ratings downgrades. And even banks, which are otherwise fine, will suddenly find that they have to uh, tighten things up. And when the whole system does this, you actually cause the problem to worsen. And 
it's in some ways negating what the fed is trying to do is putting liquidity in could it happen in india too well anything can happen but we have put in a lot a lot of trouble to try and create all those buffers over the years mm-hmm. uh we you know we created the insolvency and bankruptcy code we we took the trouble of taking very large companies through that uh, through the insolvency process uh, we reinstated uh, creditor rights uh, much of this was painful in the year 1718 you will remember or even 19 yeah. you will remember that was, that was the time you came to india that was the time mm-hmm. came to india and one of the first things i did was to look through uh the dirty dozen mm-hmm. uh um uh, of these large corporations that have run up huge debts um and of course to do some by the way the term dirty doesn't uh, <laughs> was my application to the yeah. to to this i remember reading about it yeah yes so there were so the problem was of course that our uh, uh, back in 2015 16 our banks were stuffed with all this npas and the problem was that everybody said now oh my god what we're going to do with it uh, uh, we have this new um, uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code and uh, but you know it's never been tested hmm. so one of the conventional ideas of that time was okay there's a lot of this stuff that you know, thousands of these npas you know tens of thousands of crores of uh, 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 bad loans etc what are we going to do about it and the conventional wisdom was let's take a few relatively small cases through the system test it out and then we'll try the bigger cases hmm. now my view on this was look the complicatedness of a case is uncorrelated to its size. Okay. Okay. Huh. You can have a very large bankruptcy, hmm. but maybe a very relatively simple case. Hmm. So rather than uh, take a, a s- small case through it, why not take the biggest cases through it? Because uh, we did some analysis in uh, uh, um, in the finance ministry and we discovered 50 cases accounted for 2/3 hmm. of the problem. And in fact, one a dozen cases accounted for uh, between 25 and 30% of the problem. So resolve this first so yeah so my argument was look surely no matter how bad this insolvency and bankruptcy system is and how untested it is surely it could deal with 12 cases mm. right so we then focused on just those 12 cases which as i said we we dubbed as the dirty dozen okay. and these those were then 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 those cases did go through the um you know there was this one uh, seminar this uh, a reform agenda for 20 Forty-seven. Yes. In that, you said that in the olden days of the Planning Commission, the government was telling what the private sector should do, was telling the private sector what to do. But, uh, and I quote, you said that's not how we think about policy making anymore. And then you said that the role of the government is to provide leadership where necessary, infrastructure where essential. Now, is that the, is that the goal that the Prime Minister has laid out till twenty forty-seven? uh what is how are you guys working is this what it is minimum government uh yes so yeah. it, it, this is essentially a restating of the minimum government maximum governance point hmm. which is that it isn't the business of the government to run everything and uh unlike in the past you know wise men sitting in uh, uh planning commission telling everybody how they should live their lives uh the job of the uh, government is to provide the playing ground but it is not to be for the most part a player it can provide the playing ground it can create regulators you can call them the umpires or referees uh it can prepare the ground it can in, maybe even sell the tv rights or whatever it is but actually playing of the match the government by and large in most cases does not have a role and that is a principle that we have by and large uh uh, uh you know used hmm. uh, uh in in the last 30 years of reforms that has basically been what we have done so okay. since 1991 to now what has really been when we said reform and we said liberalization we meant roughly the same thing mm. the reason is that the last 30 years of reform was about removing the indian state from the things it should not be doing and to a large extent this is now done i mean there are the odd things this but you know the principle of privatization for example is not a matter of debate i mean it's now a matter of how, the tactical act of actually selling the criticism and, comes with yeah. that right yeah. i mean yes everybody agrees privatization yeah. necessary road sports we need oh, yeah. right but then comes that accusation that when you're privatizing when you're asking the private sector to build your roads and ports this crony capitalism which is happening no so therefore the point is you auction these things and do it in as uh, transparent. transparent a way as you have to and uh, of course 
uh, you know, asking the state itself to do it does not uh, remove uh, uh, rent seeking. So that is, uh, you know, rent seeking is a problem uh, whether you do it by the state or not by the state. Uh, that's, uh, you know, but there's the that old guard which used to say that when uh, when uh, Pandiji bit the Navratnas, there was no there was no. I think you may want to read a little bit about something called the Mundra scandal, hmm. uh, uh, which happened in 1955, which was exposed interestingly by his son-in-law Feroz, Feroz Gandhi. Gandhi, and the then uh, finance minister T uh, T K had to resign. So it is not the case that there wasn't corruption. There was corruption right from the beginning. In fact, this is in an economic case there was corruption and. Uh, even in uh, defense deals, the Jeep scandal happened in 1948. So mm -hmm. there was plenty of corruption about and there was much debated at that time. But coming back to your point, the last 30 years of reforms is about withdrawing the Indian state from the things it should not do. Mm -hmm. The next 25 years till 2047 should be about getting the Indian state to do the things it should do. And there are a whole bunch of things we need to do reforms in in order to do that. Mm -hmm. First, most important thing we need to do is legal system reform. It's not a part of the executive, but certainly judiciary is an important part of the Indian state. Enforcement of contract, delivery of justice is an important role that the Indian state needs to do. But having 40 million cases stuck in the pipeline is not the way it's getting done. So we have to, this is a reform that has to happen. Of course, you know, there are, it'll, in any kind of reform, there'll be all kinds of dimensions about a tussle between the government and judiciary and all these things will also happen. But it's got to be done. Uh, it's got to be done. And the people of this country have got to demand it. Um, yes, they should also keep track of that the government uh, does not uh, you know, politicize it and all that. That too. Hmm. But you cannot now avoid it. Okay. This reform of the judiciary system, whether it happens from inside, happens because of government, happens because of public pressure or some combination of the three or in part and you know uh, preferably in part that all these three are in partnership that would be perfect but some sort of reform of the judicial system has to happen okay number one number two we also now need to do something about reforming the administrative system and the bureaucracy uh, here too uh, you know every government around the world needs an administrative system a bureaucracy and so on to to basically run the country yeah, the, the general administration of the country. So saying that, oh, get rid of the bureaucracy, eventually doesn't work. Every country has some sort of a bureaucracy. The problem is that the Indian bureaucracy was created under colonial rule, and its purpose was not service delivery, but control. Right? Naturally, they were small elite ruling the country. And now what happens is that we become independent. This uh, bureaucracy, however, becomes very useful uh, as also the tool for a socialist system of uh, economic uh, planning and mm. uh, 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 and uh, running the government. So we go from one control system to an even more control system where it needs licenses and permits and all kinds of other things. So the bureaucracy actually, rather than become weaker, actually becomes even more powerful. Now 1991 comes along and since 1991 the what has happened is that this there has been a rollback of the state, so the rollback of the powers of the bureaucracy. But the reducing of the powers of the bureaucracy doesn't mean the bureaucracy ha has been reformed. It's just given less powers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need to go to a gazetted officer anymore to get all kinds of things signed. So he has been withdrawn or she has been withdrawn, but they have not been reformed. The power. <laughs> yeah, so what you now need to do is to go through administrative reforms to get, get the... Uh, bureaucracy to think uh, to be to be uh, designed not for control but for delivery of service. Hmm. Police reforms included in this. Police reforms are also part of this. Part uh, of this. Part yeah. of this. So okay. Generally, getting the machinery to be service oriented. Okay. I.e., today there's no point in complaining that uh, the bureaucracy is not delivering because it's not designed to do this. And no in no individual. Uh, you know, there may be individual, you know, IS officer or IPS officers particularly good and forward looking, etc. But that can't be the basis of this. No, yeah. See, we are all trying to improve the individuals. No, not system overhaul. System does not, uh, does not. Uh, yeah. So hmm. you know, you you There's ask. There's an overhaul that you absolutely. Changed. You take okay. uh, how does a district get run? It gets run by a district magistrate or district collector. Yeah. Uh, average district magistrate is 33 years old, 34 years old, very junior person, has no experience in ever running anything. Yeah. Suddenly, he's made the virtual king of that district. 
Yeah. Uh, he or she is there for two years. That absolutely has no chance of even finding out half the things that need to be done. And mm-hmm. the, inevitably, he or she is made uh, chairman of every third committee in that <laughs> district. And they probably don't even haven't had chance to even attend one meeting or chair one meeting of whatever it, that subject yeah, is. Yeah. So we need to, for example, make the district magistrate a more senior role. Allow people to be there for longer periods of time and take this as the this is the cutting edge of administration, right? Okay. So there are many many things that need to be done. Okay. So judicial reforms, admin reforms. The, I mean, I can keep going. You but, can keep but going. These, but, okay. the, the, but these two reforms are absolutely critical. Getting the Indian state to deliver uh, 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 um, the things it's supposed to do, uh, uh, justice. And then, of course, administration, which includes, of course, municipal administration, other police uh, policing and other things. You know, uh, you're very active on social media, uh, Sanjeev. So a couple of questions which I have, which came up, uh, you know, which I've seen you respond also. Um, this whole thing that, you know, these reforms will be carried out or these changes are being carried out because of electoral autocracy. There's this term which is being bandied a hell of a lot where it says that because the BJP has the numbers, they are they are thrusting this down the throats of people where it there is no consensus in the country about these things. So all democracy is supposed to be through majorities, no? Um, as long as uh, a, a certain class were had the majority in parliament, not necessarily majority of population voting for them, and a majority in parliament, even if it was in coalition, they thought it was democracy. When they get voted out for a variety of reasons, this elite now suddenly finds that democracy isn't uh, uh, such a useful thing after all. So, and by the way, it's not only in India, many places in the world, what's happening is that the idea of liberal democracy is that self-certified liberals win, right? So whenever the self-certified liberals don't win, then it becomes some, you have to create these oxymorons like electoral autocracy. I mean, it's just completely absurd things. Uh, uh, in the idea itself is absurd. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is, by the way, as part of a much more systematic uh, thing that we are seeing worldwide. Uh, and I've written about this, by the way. I've written working papers, articles about this. How we are seeing systematically uh, uh, a narrative built against India, whether it's by VDEM, or EIU, or Freedom House, all of them, by the way, funded by nebulous private charities such as the op- Soros's, Soros's o- Open Society, etc. And they have the same narrative filtering through systematically. So this is also part of uh, a, 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 a global power game in which we are, you know, we have no choice but to participate. Mm. But we have to be out there and keep questioning all these... Um, Power, we have to participate, like why? why? Because, you see, we cannot ignore these things. So let me explain this. Many of these uh, indices, like, you know, the ones that I just mentioned, they, these institutions publish a whole bunch of things, you know, index on global freedom, hmm. index on democracy, academic freedom, and so on. And uh, you will see India is always rated as low as possible. Yeah. So... Uh, you know, yeah. you have 140 countries. It's very annoying. <laughs> yeah, 140 countries ranked on democracy. India is 108. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or we are rated in academic freedom below Afghanistan hmm. and Pakistan. I mean, just imagine. Yeah. So there's obviously not even a pretense of being objective about this whole matter. Hmm. So I began writing about this uh, 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 for some, t- some time now. And the response is also quite funny. Hmm. Uh, the VDEM's director basically comes and doesn't doesn't respond to any of my criticisms. Instead says, no, no, our things must be right because we use high maths and a supercomputer to work this out. So why do you need a supercomputer? All you did was took opinions of 25 people. That's it. Mm-hmm. I mean, a survey of 25 people to decide on how the world should be ranked. You've got to be kidding me. Mm-hmm. So this is the level of operations that is happening. But all this while, we never called them out. And a lot of people's view was, oh, you know, uh, ignore them. You can't ignore them. I'll tell you why. Because you see, many of these things get slyly hardwired into real life things. So, for example, all these indices by VDEM, EIU, uh, Freedom House, many others, they eventually end up in something called the World Bank's World Governance Indicators. Now, this in turn is... 20% of the weightage at many of our sovereign ratings. 
and sovereign ratings have an impact on on yeah. on the on rate FBI, at which you, everything. On, on on kinds of things this is mm. therefore a kind of power mm. that is in a <laughs> secondary way uh, uh, managing narratives is ex- uh, is used by these nebulous funders to essentially uh, manage the world <laughs> let's say mm. and this is by the way being extended so don't please take this seriously there's something called the esg Uh, norms you will see this everywhere from now on it's called environment social and uh, governance uh, norms and there is a very strong lobby worldwide uh, trying to in, in put these norms and indicators and indices into investment decisions trade decisions and so they will be used against us why um well because it serves various purposes uh, in terms of you see india is a rising power and we don't seem to be listening to um you know western narratives or, or at least of the deep states in many of these countries mm. and so many of the deep state and corporate and uh, uh, geo strategic interests um will want to trip us mm. uh, on on i mean we should expect this to happen but, but i'm just telling you that, that do not be blind to what is a very well oiled machinery okay and this is not just happening in these perception indices by the way i've you talked about perception indices but i will be in the next few days also publishing a, a working paper on how this happens even in hard uh, data huh. so when you see the un population uh, division uh, calculating india's uh, say um, uh, expected uh, 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 you know uh, expected uh, life uh, um, Uh, life, uh, life life expectancy, expectancy. life expectancy huh. at birth um or uh, ilo is calculating uh, female labor participation or who is creating a global standard for all stunting and then it gets into all these global hunger index and all of this yeah and, and of course I, freedoms no freedoms and all that perception so perception. all those perception ones there is yeah. there's a lot of debate uh, there's also professor babonas who's also been raising this yeah. i've been raising it for years so there's at least some uh some, some understand pushback, some push back that these these yeah. opinion based stuff is dodgy okay but now but, the but, hard but one. the hard data ones are also dodgy okay and i'm as i said i'm going to publish a paper very very shortly i've been writing about it in newspapers and otherwise but i'm publishing a working paper very shortly where i will show you when this hard data is systematically uh, tainted hmm. and one of the sad facts is that our own data agencies are uh are participating in it by not applying their minds to many of these global um sort of standards and so on there's no pushback from our own data agency so one of the things i'm trying to do is to get there be a much greater uh, consciousness in the government and in non government uh, data agencies in india that when you apply global standards sometimes they are good sometimes they are not so good sometimes they are appropriate so it's not always they're inappropriate but we seem to all there seems to be something very odd that of the many many of these indices which i went through you never find there being an error on the upside hmm the error is always to the downside to the downside okay, okay. Huh. now how can that be possible yeah yeah so i think there has to be some investigation into the matter now some part of it may be uh, simply um you know not some grand conspiracy just that 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 sectoral interest in that sector wants to exaggerate how big that problem is in that sector because they then get grants both from the government or private sector or international grants by exaggerating the problem so that is one part of the problem certainly mm. because i found that in many of these cases um the people in that sector are aware of this mm-hmm. but what but they don't seem to be there doesn't seem to be any great interest in correcting the error so you know uh, sanjeev i was uh, uh talking about you know the many hats you wear now you came back to india in 2017 and there were many like you who you know came in 2014 and 2017 to be part of uh mr modi's agenda or the bjp's agenda for india in the uh next decade or whatever they had their plans it reminded me a lot about when uh, rajiv gandhi came uh to power he invited a whole bunch of young people saying come and be part of the india story Pakistani say that that happened when Benazir Bhutto came to power she also got a whole you know all these educated elites of Pakistanis who were working in England who were working in uh, in the US saying come be part of the Pakistan story um 
did that inspire you in some way when um, Mr. Modi came to power that, yeah, you want to be here, you want to be in India? What was it that made you leave a, a relatively cushy job and come to India? So let me say that um, India has a longish tradition of this, by the way. Mm. So <clears throat> they have, at least in the space of economists, so let me just stick to that part. Uh, you saw, for example, Manmohan Singh, uh, is also part of that uh, yes. phenomena. Then you had a generation that happened around about the uh, liberalization time a little bit before when you had Montek Singh, yeah. uh, Vijay Kelkar yeah. and others who came. So there was also that. And then uh, later on you had briefly Raghuram Rajan, for example, Amartya came and went back. But yeah. So there were there has been a history, at least in the field of economics, of... Uh, uh, Indians living outside of India or leaving their jobs, coming back and, and carrying on here and being quite successful. I mean, Manmohan Singh went on and became prime minister. But some of them didn't stay. I mean, some of them went back, like Arvind Subramaniam, hmm. um, Raghu went back as well. So there's a you know mixed bag, but the idea of people coming and participating in, in the India story uh, is, uh, is a, is a, is a well-established one uh, well before me. Uh, in my personal case, of course... Uh, you know, I've been uh, very much uh, uh, aligned to a particular uh, way of thinking about uh, the um, I I India, its economy, and so on. And, <clears throat> um, of course, the term right wing is bandied about. And, mm. I, and I understand that it doesn't always uh, exactly translate into the Indian context. But for the for the lack of a or conservatives, a, maybe or maybe or nationalist or whatever nationalist, you may want yeah. to call it. Anyway, huh. you know what I mean. Yeah. So there is a group of thoughts hmm. which I subscribe to, which aligns with uh, certainly what Prime Minister Modi is trying to do. Hmm. And so I had actually met him even before he became Prime Minister when he was in Gujarat, hmm. and of course when he uh, he comes to power, um, uh, I was uh, you know I was very very happy. And then at some point in time, uh, you know, I I have the I had the uh, opportunity of joining this uh, uh, his, uh, 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 finance minister Jaitley's mm. team, and mm. then I served under him uh, as principal economic advisor. Uh, then uh, finance minister Nirmala Sitharaman uh, after him, and then a year ago I then shifted to uh, become uh, Prime Minister Modi's economic uh, member of his economic council. So that's been my journey. I have to say it's been absolutely fabulous. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know what the others think about it. Uh, maybe they have to put up with a somewhat yeah. idiosyncratic character. But uh, um, I, I have always, had a great time. You know, I always like to know about the author, not just about the book. What... Uh, leads you to write about Indian history. You're an economist. You you have a day job which is so exhausting because you're working on a, uh, you know, on transforming the Indian economy. Um, what is it that you do that inspires you? What is it that you do to relax, to give you ideas? What 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 makes you what you are? So I am believer in the what is in uh, in basketball is called the full court press. So okay. that play the whole thing, you know. You know. Mm. So I don't believe I don't have any silos in my head. Mm. Um, You're I, not center right, center left, center. No, that's an ideological point. I'm saying okay. silos in, in basketball. My head. I was talking. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, that's a no, no. I play no. the whole okay. thing. So okay. you you play forward, back, continuously. It's a it. Mm. Maybe people find it more exhausting, uh, mm. but. In my head, there are no silos. There is no silo between history, geography, economics, urban design, okay. uh, or any other space in life. Because these are actually pedagogical separations. Yeah, I mean, because you talk about monuments also. So many yes. times I've seen you've, I mean, you've taken pictures in your book. It's yeah, I've even published reports published, on uh, yeah. what we should do with Management national monuments of, and so yeah. on. So uh, in my head, there is no separation between these two. In fact, in real life, there isn't any separation between these two. Hmm. Um, and so I think... The fact that these subjects are taught separately, uh, that is just a uh, you know, convenience of the academic system. Hmm. The real world does not uh, uh, function in silos at all. And I don't see why they, we should, in, real, in the real world, have these silos. If, if you have the processing power to deal with uh, different things and you find them interesting, do it. But the perception about, hmm. uh, about uh, the right wing, if I, I mean, I'm using that term, I know nobody likes it, or the right and left, but the perception about the right wing is, 
ये लोग दे नॉट हैप्पी पीपल दे डोंट नो हाउ टू रिलैक्स दे डोंट नो सो दे दे आर यू नो वेरी संस्कारी दे विल ईट ओनली वेजिटेरियन फूड दे विल नॉट दे नॉट अर्बनिस्ट यू आर एन अर्बनिस्ट एब्सोल्युटली राइट सो द एंटायर आइडिया यू नो दैट यू आर ब्रेकिंग दैट स्टीरियोटाइप्स वेल एज फार एज वेजिटेरियन फूड इज कंसर्न लेट मी से दैट आई एम ऑन रिकॉर्ड टू से दैट I am a great lover of crustaceans okay as is well known but that's against stereotype no bengali okay fir <laughs> yeah so you know people uh, uh, so i i i think people have these stereotypes so there's yeah. no particular reason to have them um you know i have also written books uh, like life over two beers mm. uh, and um, you know what do i relax cricket well, cricket no not no. cricket not, not cricket not cricket no i you know i cannot understand how people watch test cricket This is really like watching paint dry. If you no, want, if you want to, don't say that. Absolutely, if you want to lounge around on the lawns for five days, choose croquet. <laughs> okay. Oh God, the most boring thing ever. Yeah, the same thing as Test cricket. Uh, <laughs> if you want to make it interesting, get rid of the pads and the helmets. Maybe I'll watch it. Otherwise, That's please. That's a blood sport you want to watch. Yeah, so you know, I like martial arts. I, right. I, I am a black belt in Taekwondo. I, you know, I like watching uh, mixed oh, martial really? arts, okay. boxing. Uh, you I, trained in martial arts. Yeah, I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. Now that's something that your ancestors would love, right? Yes. Shooters, and then now you have. Yeah, no, Akhada runners. They used to run Akhada. So yes, absolutely. Both, uh, okay. both Laliniksha Sanyal and uh, Sachin Sanyal were very much, uh, uh, you know, used to run Akhada. So very much. Uh, my so thing. much for Punjabis who think that Bengalis are more into art and culture and have nothing to do with uh, uh, with martial arts and all. And here you are. So it's it's so a stereotype, right? So right. Bengalis, uh, at least you know the stereotype Bengalis yeah. have of Punjabis. They're not into culture but agriculture. Agriculture. But that's not true. A Punjabi um, music and poetry has a very long and rich history. Yeah. So the same thing is true of Bengal. Uh, you know, hundred years ago, interestingly, Bengalis were known for being entrepreneurs. Do nobody yeah. thinks of that as yeah. being the case? Yeah. Uh, my own family, as I told you, my mother's. family of entrepreneurs so so there is uh, uh, there are there you know one and is you travel a lot i've seen in your book that you you weren't just um you didn't just go uh, into a library and do your research you went to all those places and you want to partake in the culture of the place like absolutely I've, you've gone and you've you've tasted cuisine uh, somebody takes you to a restaurant in a place which you imbibe yes so in, in, in it's not so much clear in this book but my earlier, earlier books, books is even also. more yeah. so that i go to those places and i talk about what happened but even here i go to raj bihari uh, yeah. bose's restaurant in in uh, tokyo hmm. and tasted the, the his recipe for example yeah, of chicken yeah. curry so my view here is that you need to be able to in, engage in it now there is also a personal angle to this i actually don't like writing where people don't realize this no uh, after so many books no i actually dislike writing i actually like researching them okay. i thoroughly enjoy researching all these books you go to places you do cool stuff you 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 know yeah. so i enjoy that part of the thing but and you then humanize those people so much you know there it's not dry characters in your book yes and then when you I, talk like you said about uh, the curry yes so talk. i go and eat because by the way raj bihari bose yeah. earned his living uh, running a restaurant so <clears throat> so you know and his and his and his chicken curry is still uh, uh, his recipe is still being used in tokyo so people interest you right it's not just it's not people just in- dry interest yeah people in- interest me but i think what interests me is actually the act of researching all of this it mm. because i said there's i don't have too many silos in my head mm. so this is part of that I, you know i like to immerse myself in the world in general hmm. so this is part of that immersion process so when i'm researching it it makes no sense going and spending all your time in the library uh and by the way if you just do that you'd actually miss many many important things like for example yeah. it may say in the uh, in the memoirs let's say that i went into and so place and went down this lane and turned left now somebody who just read it in a, in in a book Hmm. will not understand that turning left is important because if you go there you'll see that if you turn right something totally different would have happened yeah but there is no way you would be able to tell that if you just read it so you have to go to that place immerse yourself into it and as i said it's part of what i do anyway as a uh, yeah. you know so i you know i went to uh, and and some of it i enjoy myself doing like the cellular jail thing yes. uh, till you went and saw those uh, rooms yes uh, that just to say that they were tortured wasn't yeah, enough yeah you can't tell you have to go there these are 
tiny room, smaller than this room, yeah. uh, cold brick walls, and you know, with just a door, a, a, a barred uh, door in front of you. Where, by the way, it's been designed in such a way that the, the prison guards can continuously watch you, hmm. whereas you can't yeah. talk to anybody on either side. So it has been designed for a particular kind of mental control, mm. and you know you can read all of you want about it. Like Jallianwala Bagh, yes. unless unless you go, you go there, there, you don't. It, it, you feel suffocated when you go Not there. Not just that, you don't unless. also realize that you know a few weeks later, uh, Dyer was actually given a saropa in uh, in the yes. Golden Temple. Now that is bad in itself. But when you go there, you realize that the Jallianwala Bagh and the Golden Temple are 300 meters apart. Yeah, you're literally going to the same location, and you are being honored for carrying out genocide. So I think it's very, very important to go to the place. Otherwise, that is again a part which was the band aid. I keep coming back to that: the collaborators and the band aid. That yeah. nobody talks about how he was given a saropa, about how there were collaborators then. Absolutely, Ooh. they are collaborators then, and they are collaborators now. I I'm mean, coming you, back to the book, even though. Yeah, but I you, you can see that happening yeah. even in today. Yeah. So, for example, even this uh, suspicious narrative that is continuously bandied about about India, you know, uh, electoral autocracy and all of this. Yeah. Uh, or, for example, the BBC uh, program that was recently done, very yeah. controversial one. What is interestingly that much of this is actually done by people of Indian ethnic origin. So this collaborator class is still there. Interestingly, many of these people are direct descendants of those collaborators. But point is that this class has always existed, and we can't deny that uh, you know few hundred thousand uh, Brits ran a country of hundreds of millions of people. It was only possible because of collaboration. But today, there's no monetary benefit that they would get no, by doing the, that. The, well, first of all, there is monetary benefit. I mean, after all, uh, you wouldn't need uh, billionaires to be funding this stuff otherwise, would you? Um, and then there are intelligence agencies of friendly countries, uh, some of them in our neighborhood. Um, there are corporate interests um, mm. and so on. So I think you have, I mean, you know, the entire episode relating to vaccines, for example, just happened three years ago. Mm. Um, uh, clearly driven by all kinds of corporate interests. Uh, yes. And it comes out later and then you say that oh, they weren't exactly Cassandras who were warning us about this. Hmm. Uh, oh, the other thing that which I wanted to ask you, you know, which when you would, we were talking about the book was about when you had written about how Marxist literature was kept in those uh, jails and it was... Uh, tell me about the influence of Marxism on the revolutionaries. I'm coming back to the book, though I was done with the book, but I'm going to come back to it. And, and the other thing hmm. was about the influence of uh, Hinduism also, because many people think that the revolutionaries were atheists and agnostic. Not at all. Not at all. So not back. at all. So, yeah. first of all, um, a very large part of the, uh, of the revolutionary movement is directly derived from not just Hinduism, but a specific branch of it, the Shaktiism. Uh, many of them were very strong shaktas, uh, i.e. worshippers of Bhavani or uh, Durga or Kali and so on. Many of the initiations into the revolutionary movement happened with a, uh, you know, a text in Gita or Veda or something in one hand, a sword or a revolver in the other hand, and oath was taken to Durga or Bhavani or Kali. So, Shaktiism is a very important part of this. When you listen to Vande Mataram, the first two stanzas are relatively secular about the, uh, the motherland, but the next three are clearly derived from uh, Shakta image, Im imagery. So, the, uh, the, uh, the part of Vande Mataram which not many people recite. Yes, but you part. should you should listen to it. Yeah. In fact, for this book, I actually created for the, the, the third and fourth stanzas, I, uh, I, I got my... Uh, younger son to create a video for it by the way yeah. uh, you can see it on online
शरीरे आहुते तुम्हें मा शक्ति हृदय तुम्हें मा भक्ति आहुते तुम्हें मा शक्ति हृदय तुम्हें मा भक्ति तुम्हार प्रतिमा करे मंदिरे what happens is that you know it's important to remember this uh, because this is the section that was sung by the revolutionaries to the gallows mm. and so hinduism and more gen- more specifically shaktism uh, was a uh, very major part of the ideological driving force of all of this and it by, comes in that anand mart movie also absolutely yeah. comes in anand mart and by the way they are also being inspired by for example shivaji hmm. who himself is inspired by bhavani hmm. so there is this very strong lineage of uh, ideas and so on now somewhere in the 1920s uh, interest hmm. arises in marxism because remember till the point of uh, the russian revolution nobody really has heard of marxism in india hmm. it's really in the late 20s this something pops up um but in in the the revolutionaries living outside india are the first to find out about it many of them by the way have become refugees in soviet union because they have nowhere to rush, run away so they end up in tashkent and one of them mn roy actually founds the uh, communist party of india in tashkent in the early 1920s but in india nobody knows much about this till the very late 1920s and one of the very first people to read about uh the uh, marxism in india is of course bhagat singh mm. but it is very important to remember that bhagat singh is not the founder of uh, the communist movement in india yeah. he is in fact himself a part of a explicitly nationalist movement uh, he is hanged do remember for uh, 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 avenging the death of lala lajpat rai who would today be called hindu nationalist mm. um Uh, his movement the hindustan republican association and the revolutionary movement from which he derives himself is led by somebody called sachindranath sanyal who uh, totally despises marxism and he writes that repeatedly in his book so he's a completely anti marxist so in his uh, uh, tract which he lit, wrote while in jail called why am an atheist bhagat singh himself says that uh, you know i am the only person in this system leftover who is who is kind of believes in marxism and everybody else is uh, yeah. is uh, a nationalist uh, and uh, uh, and so on so that is the uh, 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 that is how things were till the 1930s now what happens is that the communist movement begins to uh, gather pace in the 1930s uh, there are many reasons for this uh, some of it is russian support but interestingly uh, also reason was that the british actually supported the spread of marxist literature in indian jails to the revolutionaries uh to in order to divide them hmm. uh from the nationalists so many revolutionaries went into jail as nationalists and came, came out, out as... as marxists and of course uh by the ni- 1930s uh, who controls the communist party it's british communists and to some extent the russian communists there's some conflict between the two but british com- communist double agents like uh, uh, rajni palme dat who was half indian half swedish uh, and many others and of course it turns out to be a great investment because of course the the marxist uh, uh, former revolutionaries now marxists uh, uh, communists uh, side with uh, the british during the second world war uh and so you have uh, the communist party leaders calling um netaji as you know running dog of tojo and you know criticizing him and so on so <clears throat> that is how it happens now what happens unfortunately is that emin roy the original founder of the cpi drifts off from the party and of course after independence there is another problem that uh, you know they had said all these bad things about uh, people like netaji and they didn't really participate in the freedom, freedom struggle. struggle so they adopt bhagat singh as a sort of see our guy had also participated in in mm. in the freedom struggle but in fact bhagat singh had nothing to do with the communist party of india mm. um so they are retrospectively uh, bringing him back and that is why you have the strange situation three people are hanged on the same day for the same crime bhagat singh sukhdev thapar and rajguru you only hear about bhagat singh why 
because he has been resurrected by uh, the marxists mm. and because he is the only person they could sort of say ah see our marxist guy also did something mm. and so he then becomes like a, a founding father of marxist movement and def- and also freedom fighter and is adopted and built out in subsequent decades um of course Ma- bhagat singh is a remarkable person but uh, his subsequent not an icon of marxism is what you're saying yeah he's not quite an icon of marxism he's, he was not a part of the marxist movement he was yeah. a part of a nationalist movement yeah. as i said he he ultimately gets hanged for avenging the death of a hindu nationalist yeah. the other two who are hanged with him would today also be called hindu nationalists so yeah. uh you know it's rather we're rather difficult into, uh, <laughs> into a, we're going to go into a burrow now about where hindu nationalism and uh, that's a whole different thing yes. so anyway um for all of you do read this it's a very easy read doesn't take much time but very interestingly told story about so many heroes that we should have known about thank you sanjeev for being part of this podcast thank you so much for having me here Thank you for watching or listening into this podcast do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this Namaste Jai Hind Click here to watch the previous episodes